Hello. Welcome back to the session. All right. We'll now have a, a session on economics. So today we have uh, Mr. Law Weijing with us today. He is uh, an economist at the Goldman Rating Agency. Good morning, guys. So, Mr. Weijing, what do you do actually at the Goldman Rating Agency? Well, is it linked to Goldman Sachs? Well, not really, but actually we are we are um, rating on bonds, and we are underwriting some um, some bonds, mostly on bonds. Mm-hmm. To the market, you know, but, uh, basically on the government side. So, yeah. Oh, so you are a consultant to the government? No, not really. But we we can't say that we are consultant in 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 economy side. We are very specific on what we do. So at this point, we are an economist at this point. Hmm. Yeah. So who are your clients then? My clients, um, mostly private. As for now, private banks that um, like CIMB, like May banks that they undertake some bonds from the government, but they lack of expertise to run these programs in the banks. So they will need some, they will, you know, like outsource some to, for us to build the algorithms behind. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that uh, currently your work covers a lot of the Asian economies. Or what? What is the main countries that your work covers? Well, I hate to say that it's not actually ASEANs, but we do travel to Hong Kong very frequent, like twice a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but Hong Kong is not an ASEAN country, and it's not even a country so far. So, <laughs> yeah. So how 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 do you look at uh, the economy in Malaysia? Let's start with that. Well, the outlook is quite stable for the next few years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's just that we have a we have to go through a structural change. What kind of structural change? For the past few years, Malaysia Malaysia ringgit has been strong against the greenback. Okay. So it's like three three ringgit to one US dollars through nine eight, or maybe some. At at one point two eighty eight, so at that point we have a very strong consum- private consumption's powers in our private sectors. We are talking about general consum uh, general consumers like you know me and other people. But as Maringa, Malaysia ringgit is um, weakening after the elections last year, so we were expecting that the private consuming power will be weakened as well. But then we our government's revenue and the main economic drivers will not be private consumptions anymore, but more on the uh, export sides. Mm. Yeah. But can I know why is it that the ringgit is weakened? Well, it can be a lot of factors. In a lot of in a lot in, in economics, we can't say for sure. But that in other countries, most of the countries, are post two thousand eight. Crisis. Most of the countries across the globe, we, they are trying to weaken their currencies to, you know, to I- increase their competitiveness. But are you sure it is intentional? Um, because you you were mentioning that the economy of Malaysia looks to be set to be stable for the yes, next yes, few years. Yeah. But uh, from from an everyday person point of view, it yeah. looks that inflation is rising. Yeah, that that is a, a, a problem that we have to look into. We are talking about stable. You say that in the sense that we are not having any crisis at all, right? And we do not have any default payments in any of our government bonds. Okay. And the um, what's the name of the rates again? The um, rate of default payments in private sectors so so stable. So we were expecting that our economy size will grow by about five percent this year. Mm-hmm. And if it's growing, how bad can it be? But even then, where we had a recent, let's say, turun, you know, himpunan, yes, that yes. is a you know a, a rally that was uh, organized mainly by the students and youth who were who felt that they were facing a lot of uh, uh, rising prices, price hikes, and they have organized during a the. The anniversary, no, not anniversary, the countdown to 2014, a, a rally in 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 our Independence Square s- to demand that the price hikes be stopped. So, I, are you sure that you know the economy will remain stable, or 
it, it, it will always remain stable as long as the private sector are paying their their debt. Their salary, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, well, as I have mentioned earlier, when we say stable, is that we will not go through any major crisis at all, and we will be paying our debts um, timely and sound. So, okay. in, in the context of that, I, we don't see any imminent threats to our economy mm-hmm. for the past few years. And also, um, m- some of my NGO friends uh, have shared that the oil that's fueling our the growth of our economy seems to be drying out. So, uh, is this also not a sorry? Come again. The, the fuel, the, the oil, like a uh, petroleum, right? Uh-huh. So, and I. If uh, if we understand it correctly, it fills forty percent of uh, Malaysia's economy. So if this is affected, how many percent that the, does the private sector contribute to to the Malaysian economy? Well, if you're talking about economy, I'm not sure you're talking about the GDP size or you're right. talking about the government's right. on the government revenue. But right. if you are talking about the government revenue, the uh, petroleum, well, the Petronas, they paid like three billion in. What wait thirty billion in dividend every year to the government? Right, because I believe that forty percent that I'm referring to is actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was for GDP. Forty percent of GDP. Well, it constitute if for exports, it might be forty percent. But um, in the other sense, that in the GDP, I don't think it's forty percent at all. Yeah. But you mentioned that the export. Um, Will be growing, and it will Malaysian economy. No, will I mean, be I'm more saying export- that the petronas, the petrols products and derivatives, they might have forty percent of um, counted for forty percent of our mm-hmm. exports. But then for GDP, I don't remember the uh, the figure will be that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned that Malaysia will be a more export oriented economy yes, yes. for the for years the to come. Two, yes, exactly. Ah, okay, so. If 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 all do constitute uh, close to forty percent of yeah. our export economy, and once that dries up, uh, it will be a big problem for Malaysia unless there are other um, new industry that Malaysia is exploring. Yeah, I I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in petrols because okay. uh, although it is a very it has already constituted a very important role in our GDPs, exports, and our government budgets. But I have to say that uh, the government has. Also realize the problem of the oil is going to dry up, some way, somehow, some days. So they are trying to expand to another sectors like, well, you already know GST that will about collect to help the government to collect about like 20b for the government revenue. That is why the government is so desperate to implement this. GST yeah. in the years to come. Twenty yeah. billion for the government, but yeah. you know, at, at the expense of the people. Yeah, it is true. That is true. Mm-hmm. And which which is causing a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the government from the people's point of view. Well, well, that I have to I I, I do understand, but most of the time um, we have to think that whether we are standing on the corporate point of perspective or we are standing on the point of the perspective of a rakyat. Mm-hmm. If you're standing on the point of the uh, perspective of the corporate, then you would think most of the corporate they thinks that this is the right thing to do, and the government thinks it's the right thing to do. But if you're standing on the other side of the hand, then you would think that this will be a distress to the people. Mm. So for um, for the current state of economy uh, from the past few years until today, uh, besides the 2008. Um, crisis. There hasn't been any major thing, you know, and it looks to be stable for the next few, few years, years. Exactly. But I have to highlight. Uh, I have, there's one thing that I like to highlight is that the cash that holds by our government is running low as well. Okay. At the moment, so we do have a lot of national debts. All right. Yeah. Uh, most of the people or the netizens, they already know that we are holding like 500 B of debts. Okay. So with the 500 B of debts, we are paying almost like 20 B of interest every year that okay. you have to pay every year or you will be look, or we will be looking at a default in our government bonds payment. Mm-hmm. Out of the 20 B of the interest we have to pay every year, our government is now only holding like less than 10 B in cash, which right. means <laughs> if they are going to pay that interest next year, 
they have to sell some of the assets okay. under the government accounts. That could be shares, could be real estate. Well, we're still looking. We are still um, uh, paying a scrutiny into this matter as we speak. Right. So I'm just curious, um, and also asking on behalf of the listeners who might not uh, have uh, economic background. So who does the government pay this twenty billion to? To the well, private the, sector. Yeah, the the major bonds holders for the government bonds are private, which are the banks that we name in Malaysia, like public banks, uh, May banks. Hmm. Hong Leong's, M Banks, these are the major bonds holders of our government bonds, which means th- these, it is these banks that lends the money to our government. Mm. Yeah. Unlike in Greece or other countries, in Greece, most of the bonds are held by foreign banks. So whenever the foreign banks retract their money, Greece government has a problem. Okay. Yeah. So the majority of bond holders are local banks in Malaysia. In Malaysia. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and, and, and let's clarify a little the concept of bond to our listeners. So basically, <laughs> uh, the bank, uh, uh, local banks in Malaysia, for example, Maybank would, would buy, um, buy a bond and in, in buying a bond or is it the yeah, government? Yeah, yeah, it's buying right? a bond. Yes. Buying a bond, uh, they effectively lend government the money exactly. and then, but with an interest. Yes. And then the government will have to pay back the bond, yes. uh, by, uh, by the maturity date. Mm, by the maturity so, date. There's a one year bond, two years, five years, right. ten years. Right. So before the, the, before the maturity, all the government have to do is to pay the interest. Mm. That's what's the interest I'm talking about. Yeah. You don't have to pay on the, on, on the, the, the whole lump sum of the money. You know, like if you are lending 10B, you don't have to pay 10B. You pay the interest. The interest is normally three to four percent. All right. So in next year, the government will have to pay 20B. Mm-hmm. In cash, mm-hmm. that's the problem. They don't have twenty B in their account right now. Do you think they'll be able to master that amount? Well, they have to. I mean, they have a lot of ways. Like you know, the government they likes to issue small bonds, like right. you know, Amanaraya, so- and they like to give out Wawasan bonds to not just to the to the banks, also to the rakyat. The rakyat will the people. Yeah, the yeah. people. The people will like to buy government bond as well. Whenever we issue bonds, the government bonds, you see, the rugby. But that's just, not really solving the problem, isn't it? They are just filling up uh, yeah, the yeah, debt those, by yeah. incurring other debt. Yes, yes, they are. Okay. Would you see that this will be a problem in the future? It will be, but not in a very short future. Uh, you're looking at... I, we have a uh, algorithm, we have a, uh, you know, uh, equations that says the problem might happen at least five years later from now. Ah, okay. Yeah. Until then, we'll, we'll be fine. Is this an <laughs> optimistic outlook or a, a realistic or a pessimistic? Definitely not pessimistic, but... Well, I would how? put it is is a... is um... is a realistic. It uh-huh. is. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because in, in this... in what we are doing, we don't give very risky assessment. I know people might say that look at it as a P... As a standard and poor rating, they rate America, but then they gave a very good rating to America's government. But then, see, the American real estate, they melt down. So, is all this um, rating agency, are they reliable? I don't, people might ask, but from my point of view, this is the best we have. You know, if the rating agency you can't trust, then who else you can trust? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, is there a lot of rating agencies like yourself in Malaysia? Yeah, we do have uh, quite a few. And as we are li- liberalizing the finance sector, we have more, we call it the boutique advisory right. firms are setting up. When we say boutique advisory, which means they are not banks, but they are purely um, private advisory to a lot of corporates that they can issue and help underwrite bonds. Mm. So, uh, for 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 the people though, what what is it that they could do in in this in this few months or years ahead? What are let's say some good industry that you think that is growing? A lot of things are growing. For instance, um, real estates. The price of real estate is growing, mm-hmm. and of course, mm-hmm. not just real estates but others like. Um, Daily consumptions products are also growing for say dairy products. So if you are looking into stock to be accurately, 
um, you might be looking into some stock like BAT that they produce cigarettes or maybe some Cowsbirds, GAB. These are the, the, the good stocks that you can look in that they will not be affected by any crisis at all for, from what we learned in the previous, his, previous uh, case that even during a crisis, these are the stocks that are still growing. Mm. Yeah. And now we'll have a little short break. And okay. after the break, we'll present you with a little more insights on economy. All right, sure. Hello, welcome back to our session with an economist. Now, let's move on to uh, a broader picture uh, by first talking about how um, ASEAN has progressed from being set up in the 60s and 70s to it is today. Yeah. Okay, now I I'd like to touch on the these issues about the the progress uh, the Asian has formed. The average GDP per capita increased a lot. Uh, in the um, 2005, the average GDP per capita is about 1,600 in US dollars, but then it's already doubled in year 2010. So we are looking at the capita, the um, GDP per capita has already doubled in almost five years, and it will triple in another six years. This is in terms of GDP per capita. And for others, before that, in year 2000, 1997, if I remember correctly, ASEAN, we were targeting the ASEAN countries, the 10 countries back then. We were targeting that their GDP will reach 1 trillion in year 2006, 2005. But then we were a bit behind because we only reached one trillion in 2006. But then back then in year 1997, we also was targeting the ASEAN economy to reach two trillion, two trillion by the, uh, in year 2020. But mm-hmm. then guess when we reached that? Mm-hmm. We reached nine years earlier. We mm-hmm. reached two trillion in, in GDP in 2011. So mm-hmm. which means something has changed during 2005 and 2011. Okay. Many of the people, uh, audience might have these questions like, what actually changed? Why suddenly the GDP growth rates has been so fast? And the answer would be the crisis in Europe and America that drives all the liquidity okay. yeah, to ASEANs instead of leaving the money in US or in the Europe's Eurozones. So are you sure that this is in no way fabricated? Like we have just created more GDP out of more debt? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. Mm-hmm. In all major, in all major developed countries, GDPs are created by debts. That is the basic. That's how things works in economics. Like if you are going to buy a house, you have you own a house, but also okay. you own debts. Yeah. On the same hand, mm, you low. can't. You don't just buy a house with cash. Even for normal people, I mean, even for rich people, if you earn like twenty thousand a month, you'll be buying a house for three million. If you buy a house by three million, you won't have three million in cash to buy that house. You loan, you get a loan from the bank. That is how modern, uh, modern economy works. Mm. Yeah, but if we just look at it, look at it in in a more, more layman terms. Twenty years ago, as a Malaysians, we feel the pressure of spending money in Hong Kong or to just to travel in Hong Kong. Okay. As a Malaysians, you feel like wow. Like thirty ringgit or twenty five ringgit for a bowl of noodles in Hong Kong. That's not the money I I could afford. But now, if you travel to Hong Kong, you find that it will be very easy for you to. It's not so pressure, not that much pressure to 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 have a bowl of noodles of twenty ringgit in Hong Kong. That is what we are talking about. The GDP per capita and the income per capita in ASEAN countries are growing. That we don't feel a lot of. We we are we are more affordable in terms of spending. Mm-hmm. Even in in France, in America, mm-hmm. or in Hong Kong, you're talking about maybe PPP, like purchasing yeah, yes, power purchasing parity. Power parity, exactly. But um, of course, uh, there has always been the example of South Korea and also Singapore being drawn up, like how uh, in the past, uh, you, maybe during the sixties or seventies, Malaysia's currency used to be three times uh, the, the 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 value of a Korean won, and now it's the other way around, where a Korean won is three times the 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 current 
the value of ringgit. So, do you think that Malaysian currency is really growing that much? I know where you are going with this. <laughs> Normally, people <laughs> and will... Singapore, yeah, yeah, so, exactly, classic example. Exactly, but in, in economy, of course, a strong currency doesn't always represent. I mean, mark my word, it's not always uh, an emp- empirical way to assess the how strong is your economy. Okay. Like if you are looking at Japan. Their mm-hmm. yen is almost like what 100 yen to 3 ringgit. They are even smaller than us, and the Hong Kong dollars is no, uh, twice as small as uh, as the Malaysia ringgit. Right. Uh, by that, I don't mean. I I mean, uh, for example, with, with the same thing that you could buy in, let's say, Korea. Then, okay, you only need uh, one ringgit to buy, let's say, a, a loaf of bread in Korea. But now, uh, that's how the past is. But now, you know, you need like three ringgit to buy one uh, loaf of bread in Korea. Yeah, yes, yeah. that that is true. Um, just look at it this way: it's not just the um, it's not just the inflation that is growing in Malaysia, but mm-hmm. it's also growing a lot in a lot of places across the globe. I mean, people might only see Singapore as a whole, but if you are talking in Australia. If you're talking about in South Korea, the inflation has been going up a lot as well. So, mm-hmm. when we look as economists, when we look at uh, uh, when we look at this inflation, we are talking about global, globally, and what drives up this all these inflations is not that um, people might think. I know I know where you're going with this, but this is the last thing I want to talk touch today's about okay. government management. Because right. today we are talking mainly about the Asians, okay. and if you are talking about the inflations, that would be if other economists would agree with me that it is the American. They are printing monies. Their quantitative easing policy has okay. created a lot of tons of U.S. dollars, mm-hmm. and all these monies they don't tend to stay in the United States. So mm-hmm. where did they go? They don't go to Europe because back then Europe has the same problem as America. They part of these monies they can't stay there because in U.S. if you save your money in the bank you get one percent mm. of interest, but the inflation is higher than one percent. So you can't keep all this money in America and Europe. You keep the money in Euro banks, you get zero point five percent or zero point six percent interest per year. So mm. they all this money goes to Asia, like China, Malaysia, Singapore, and other countries. This is the main reason that drives up the inflation. In the economist point of view, mm. but of course, in layman points of view, they might have other thoughts, which uh, I don't think I want to touch that part mm. on today. Government management. Yes. Okay. So um, next up, uh, what do you think uh, uh, of as the forecast uh, of the future of ASEAN economy? Why is it even important in the first place? You see, in in many countries in ASEAN, we have ten countries. Uh, basically, we are talking about six countries. From the beginning, then there were another four countries that joined in: Cambodia, um, Laos, Vietnam, and I can't remember the last one. But then, the disposable income are increasing tremendously. Mm-hmm. What is disposable income? Which means the money that you can save and you can invest that has drive up in tremendously in the past three years. In Malaysia, to be specific, five years before you wouldn't have. You wouldn't looking at a lot of people that they are investing or they are keeping their money like two hundred thousand into bank in cash, but now UOB Bank in Malaysia they are setting up this UOB privilege accounts that if you ho- if you just deposit five hundred thousand in UOB Bank you get the privilege status and they will give you a lot of you know like it's, it's the same thing like the Citibank, the Citibank if you deposit two hundred and fifty thousand or maybe like two hundred thousand. Mm. In HSBC deposit, and Citibank, yes, 200, and you get 000. and you get City Gold status that allows you to 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 have a lot of privileges. So we are now the banks in Malaysia. They are targeting all these high end incomes, and of course, trust me, when we are talking about high end income, high incomes groups, a lot of Malaysians they might think that oh, we are talking about crony, we are talking about you know governmental laundering money, but that is the general pers- uh, misconceptions. Of a lot of people, but in Malaysia we do have a lot of good businessmen, straight businessmen. They and 
bankers and maybe accountants, lawyers, well, they make like 20,000, 30,000 a year. So many people in Malaysia, they are doing the right thing and they are saving their money in the bank. And that is, uh, not, and not just Malaysia, that and across ASEAN. And th- these are the money that drives the economy to another new era. Hmm. If I could just uh, bring another perspective into this, right. I believe in Europe and other a lot of countries, there is a record low in trust of uh, banks, uh, banking institution, financial institution. But it's not happening here. Like the people like still feel that uh, that banks are very trustworthy here, and do the banks don't practice the same pol- kind of policy that they do with the money of the people? That, that in- is. You're asking a very, very good question. That goes down to the fundamental of the banking and the whole financial um, um, system. Well, let's put it this way. Banking are not as the same as what we have about a 100 years ago. Back then, whatever money the central bank prints, you need to have the equivalent amount goal, of, gold, amount of gold to back your money. Okay. So, in other words, back then... The money that the economy are backed by solid resources like okay. gold, uh, like silver. But now it's based on what? We don't need gold as a standard anymore. We don't use silver to back the liquid, li- liquidity. So w- which means it's the confidence in the system that backs the whole financial system. In Europe, in the Europeans or the America, it's not that they don't trust bank anymore, but the trust is, how, how should I say, is uh, diminishing, diminishing. Mm-hmm. Right, they used to trust bank more than now. It's because in, in U.S., especially in U.S., they have this uh, FDIC program, which is the Federal Depository Insurance Corporations, that they will buy out the bank right. if the banks went insolvency yep. um, or, or bankrupt in in what Malaysia's uh, terms. Mm-hmm. But then the they will only give a certain amount, and it's not the whole amount to the back to the depository holders. But in Malaysia, um, our government has gave this uh, insurance. Well, they already lifted that, that promise. But then during the year 2008 to 2012, if I'm not mistaken, any money that you deposit in the bank, if the bank went fail, if the bank failed, uh, then you get the whole amount of money back by our government. But then they lifted this, I think somewhere 2013, that mm-hmm. That has a ceiling. Yeah. Uh, that is like, like 200,000 or 250,000, yeah. as mm-hmm. same as the, the qualifications to enter, the threshold to enter cities, city goal, mm-hmm. 200,000 mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, in short, people are more confident in local banks because our banks, I mean, they are delivering good results. You are, we are looking at most of our banks in Malaysia, their profits are increasing like 10% year on year basis. All right. So, yeah, people are still trusting our bank in Malaysia so far. It, and is this a common uh, trend in Asian countries as well? Yes, yes, it, it is. Not just bank in Malaysia. We, if you're looking at DBS Bank in Singapore, we are looking at OCBC Bank in Singapore or some uh, bank Indonesia's. People like to keep their money in the banks and there seems to be no fear or no hesitations to put their trust in the banking system. This, I have to say that the central bank across Asia has gave a very, has did a very good job during the crisis. But will they have the same job? Will they have do, did the same job in the future? I wouldn't be so sure. Mm. So maybe mo- let's move on to the future a little. What do you think um, are upcoming challenges uh, to all these financial institutions in ASEAN countries? The idea was simple. In the Western countries, they have a relatively integrated good system in their banking. But in ASEAN countries, it's not the system that runs the bank. It's the people that runs the bank. Hmm, what's the difference? Like, the difference is that we have a very good gover- central bank governor okay. in Malaysia, in Taiwan. Of course, uh, again, Taiwan is not an ASEAN member. We have a, But then I have to touch a little bit on that. There is ASEAN plus three, yes, yeah? Yes, there's an ASEAN mm, plus so three. So which includes Japan, South Korea and China. Yeah, um, yes, and China. So when you have a very good governor, central bank governor, they are able to mitigate interests and employments and, and other stuff. Then you get a very good um, economy system. And, and the things would look really sounds, but 
I have doubt that if our Tansri Zati, the governor of yeah. Malaysia, once she step down and in her deputy take over, will things be as same as usual? Or will the government intervene in our banking, in our central bank's operation? That we have yet to know. That is why that's the major concerns in Malaysia recent outlook. And as for the ASEAN outlook for the year 2014 to 2018, the outlook is still bright. But still, we have to be very cautious on the tapering on the U.S. The, the U.S. Uh, tapering on the uh, quantitative easing um, maneuver. So we will be looking at a scenario which there will be a, uh, some outflow of mm -hmm. liquidity mm -hmm. from Asia back to U.S. and to mm -hmm. European countries. That mm -hmm. we have to be careful. So you think that's going to cause a huge impact on Russia and economy? Well, I wouldn't say that will be a huge impact, but I will be too full to deny if there is any impact on the Asian economies. That is why I have to say major central bank in in the Asian countries instead of... It's not like five years ago. Five years ago, this, the central bank governors across Asians, ASEANs, they will have to hold hands by hands together to fight against recessions and against unemployment. But things have changed tremendously in just five years. We don't have recessions, woes anymore. We don't have to worry about unemployment. Mm -hmm. What we have to be emphasizing and have to be concentrating is that inflations will have galloped out whatever GDP growth you have. Like we mentioned before, our GDP growth will be like 5% this year mm -hmm. and might be, if you're lucky, next year and the years to come. Mm -hmm. But our inflation itself, CPI, mm -hmm. Consumer Price Index, is already at 3.5, 3.3, maybe it will be go up to 4%. So in short, whatever you produce, you increase by 5%, but then the inflation mm -hmm. will have gallop, will have eaten all your GDP growth rate. So if you are good in mathematics or if you are good in finance, you will know that, well, actually, it's not growing at all. Yep. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Yeah, um, so <laughs> I, I'm curious, yeah, um, of course, all these uh, numbers are official numbers. Do you think that an unofficial number for inflation is actually higher than that? Because a lot of people seem to think so. Well, people like to think that um, banks, governments are a big conspiracy. Well, if we put conspiracy in, in this scenario, then I guess we will have never-ending story. Mm -hmm. But just look at it this way. If you look at it as a fabricated uh, figures... Um, yeah, the chicken rice increased by almost like ten percent every year. This yes. year you have it four fifty. Next year you pay like five ringgit. Yes. The increment of fifty cents is more than ten percent yes. to the original price. Mm -hmm. But then we also look at the furniture. Mm -hmm. The furniture you will buy like three thousand this year for a whole set, but the next year they might sell it at one thousand and five hundred. That we are looking at fifty percent drop. So you save one thousand and five hundred by buying furniture, by buying electronic goods. But I know where you are going. Mm -hmm. Let me finish this, all right? You, people will say that you will, you don't buy LG plasma TV or LCD every year. You only buy it every like what five years. So if you, but then we are looking at you. If you have if you can eaten chicken rice, you will be paying fifty cents more every day. But if you multiply by three hundred and sixty-five days, we are pay, we are talking about you are paying more than one thousand and five hundred just for the chicken rice. Mm. But if you are buying uh, a, a, a set of furniture, then you'll be saved like 3,000 ringgit over a, a period of three years. That would be like 500 every year. So if you balance all these things, you will get the real CPI, which is, yes, it's true, 3.5% mm. so far. Okay, but I, I would argue that some things are necessities and some things are not. Well, there, there are, in the CPI, there are certain groups, you see. But when we balance everything and we divide by the okay. numbers that is given, this is the best answer we can get. But of mm. course, if you are familiar with statistics, we have a median, we have a mode, and we have a mean. Mm. And this CPI is a result of a mean. We plus everything together and we divide by the numbers. Mm. But if you look at the mode, which means which one has occurred most of the time, then you will get food and beverages is the main food and beverages and a daily necessity is has gone up, have drives up, drives up a lot. Mm. Yeah. Thank I hope you. that answers your your your, your doubt <laughs> in a way. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I think that was very informative. Uh, so, how how can we, uh, as part of the ASEAN community, you know, work together to make sure that all these challenges are are overcome, and especially that we have a, a goal, you know, to integrate um, our not to say integrate our economy as a whole, but at least some of the goals are to make it. Uh, one community that has a single production base and a single market by 2015. That was the goal. So um, now, currently, it is the ASEAN is the eighth largest economy in the world. So it is. It is. Mm-hmm. So in the future, how can we work together more? Uh, and also, it seems like. Uh, I just want, I, I, I think one of the points that you raised was quite interesting in that it seems like the culture here uh, is more of a, a person than the system. You know, having, uh, it's not so much as having a solid system, but rather having a solid person as the governor. So it, it seems like this is a problem uh, or not, you know, up to what your views are and how can we make the things better? By emphasizing more on the systems, like what we have before, uh, we have a lawyer from the from the bar council uh, emphasize on on the liberty, fundamental liberty, and we have to strengthen the framework mm-hmm. of our legal systems. That okay. is the part that most of the ASEAN countries that they need to follow up, mm-hmm. other than just Singapore. Singapore has did a very fine job on this, but other than that, we are looking at Cambodia, Indonesia. Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand. All these countries, they are not, well, I have to say, they are not really run by the system. They are just run by the people. But then, we we don't have to really be, a part of that, we don't really have to be very pessimistic on this because all of these countries, they also have a medium, medium-term development plans. So with this, I hope they can just maintain the speed of the GDP growth rate. Like what I have in hand here, Malaysia our medium term de- development plan is to charting our countries toward the high income nations. With that, billions of ringgit have to pull out. We have to build a lot of infrastructures, like mm-hmm. for say the MRT is mm-hmm. a big, is a big project uh, that, that, uh, given out to many, not just government company, but also in private, private company. In Indonesia, they, uh, they are going to have a realizations in the pro- prosperous prosperous and democratic and just that is what I'm talking about more on the justice part democratic part and prosperous that is what Indonesia they are trying to do right now mm-hmm. in, in in Cambodia they can't emphasize on this part yet because their people are still having they are still having starvation problems so in Cambodia their medium term is to maintain growth employment mm-hmm. that is what I'm talking about they have to have a medium term development plans across mm-hmm. Asia mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, especially the point that Indonesia brought up, how justice could bring por- prosperity to the country. What, what, what is it that we're talking about in legal system that will affect the financial system? No, no, just make it this way. Like a few years back in 2008, Maybank and CIMB, they acquired a quite a number of banks in Indonesia. But then at that time, their deputy governor of the central bank of indonesia they said you can buy whatever banks in indonesia is all right but a few years later after we have acquired i mean maybank and cimb they they successfully acquired those banks then the deputy governor of the central bank of uh, indonesia they say oh you need to liquidate more you need to sell some of the shares because foreign banks, foreign holders cannot hold more than 20%, 30% of the banks, of their local banks. This is what I'm talking about. You need to have a clear and have a just system to restore foreign investment. And in Malaysia, well, I have to say, it's sad to say that our government is not really emphasizing on foreign investment because we have ample liquidity within our own system, which is also our own problem. So in short, in layman terms, having a lot of money is not good for your own country. Why? When you are too rich, you don't even care how people look at you. You just do it your own way and you don't even care to reform your system because you think that this system will may work. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, who is rich? Sorry, I'm, I'm talking about Malaysia's government. Ah, we are okay. not. We are. We are not. When we're talking about rich, you have to bear in mind that the the concept of rich doesn't just come from money. We have a lot of assets. So okay. we are not. We might not reach in cash. Our government might run out of cash, but they have a lot of assets that they can sell. So mm-hmm. when you have all this asset backing you, you don't even worry about money. Then you won't even have to think of reform and attracting more foreign investments. So when foreign investment is not drawn into this country, our country, then they will not bring their in, their experience. I'm not just talking about skills. I'm talking about experience. How to build a uh, a. Uh, uh, Countries into development countries in the next decades. That is our our challenge in the past next. Uh, I mean, in the next few years. Mm-hmm. But um, you're talking about the government having a lot of assets. You, this kind of assets are natural resource, I believe. Oh, not just natural resource. Uh-huh. So I'm talking about the funds that holds by our Kazana Berhad, okay. the funds that holds by, uh, yeah, mainly the gov- by our. Pemodala National Berhad, mm-hmm. those are controlled by our governments. So those are the assets and and the means they can utilize when it comes to whenever they need money to settle some debts, some governmental debts. Mm, okay, and currently the funds are in the country or is it mostly invested in other countries? Well, it is in our country. I, will, I mean, just look at it this way. Um, I know it's very hard for <laughs> Malaysians to say that to understand that how rich is the government. Hmm. Uh, the system is that the liquidity in Malaysia is so ample that if the government is going to buy anything from Malaysia, they would have bought, overbought Genting Highland and public banks and most of our listing company, I would say like one times. So the money is so rich that they cannot invest this money in Malaysia anymore, but instead they have to invest this money offshore, like in London. Uh, if I remember correctly, Malaysia's governments and all these uh, government funds, they invested, they are the solely biggest buyer in London real estate in year 2012. And after that, they found only they found that it's already saturated in London, mm-hmm. but then they are still so rich. So what do they do? They were moving the funds. Well, the funds are still in London. They are building these real estates in London, but then they expand their their purchasings and all this uh, buying in Frankfurt. Now they are trying to move in to Frankfurt in Germany. Mm-hmm. So let's a li- have a little comparative with other government. You are t- talking about how Malaysian government is very rich, for example. So, like, let's say Singapore or Brunei. You know, uh, is Malaysia government more rich than them? Well, it depends on how you define rich. Yeah. Again. Uh-huh. From, from your definition of rich? Well, there's always, in, like, like, like I mentioned before, when we're talking about rich, we have to look into the tangible assets and intangible assets. Intangible assets, like what you might already know, is that um, we don't only have shares, uh, equities, real estates. We also have a lot of natural resources which is part of our government's um, resources. So if I were to compare the richness, Malaysia, Singapore, and you mentioned another country before. Brunei. And, and Brunei, I would say that you have to go down, divide by the populations as per, right. per capita. So if a per capita, for so sure Singapore and Brunei, and Brunei because they have so yeah. much resources, okay. but then they have very few Populations. Okay, because yeah. I, I was just afraid that it was a, a really optimistic outlook. No, so it's I wanted not. It's a, a, it's a, a reality. It is a reality. <laughs> Insight. Okay, so but then uh, back to your questions about you know having the infrastructure, legal system, and how justice will impede um, you know having a prosperous nation. But uh, I'm thinking, is is the the policy of Bumi Putra impeding the growth, uh, especially with FDI and whatnot coming in? Well, that is an issue that I think the government should look into. Mm-hmm. Well, not just look into, make things right. So, abolishing it? No, I wouldn't say abolishing. I would say, well, as an economist, I have to be very cautious when, when it comes to this. I have to say it's either rationalized or they have to just make it right. How how do they do so? Well, I leave that to politicians as I'm not a politician at all. Yeah, okay, but basically Bumiputra is a problem. How? 
I wouldn't say it's a problem. I'm just okay. saying that we just have to make it right, make right. it just. Okay. <laughs> Every country has their own problems. Right. So whether the politicians, they are the politicians of the countries or the leader of the countries has is wise enough to mitigate on these issues, I'll just leave it to them. For me, my job is to rate and to give a, 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 a outlook on a certain region. Okay. That is what I can say for now. Okay. But is it stopping uh, foreign companies from investing in Malaysia? This having this kind of policy? They have uh, limitations on uh, certain shareholdings. That is, is the limitations. Uh, just a little context for our listeners. Uh, Bui Putra is uh, literally translated as prince of the land, uh, meaning mm. that uh, certain ethnicity, uh, let's say the Malay ethnic, uh, will have to like you mentioned, is it ha- what whole a certain, a certain percentage? I mean, if your company is going listing mm-hmm. in the bursa, mm-hmm. then you have to give out a certain shares to the Bumi Put Trust organizations, mm-hmm. not just individuals, organizations as well. And the current quota is well, if I remember percent? correctly, it's thirty percent. But mm-hmm. I have, but again, I'm not sh- I'm not very sure about it's ab- around there. Right. Yeah. Okay. So is, is this a problem to uh, that stopping the um, or at least a very important factor. It is. It is. Yeah. The uh, how is it affecting the foreign companies from investing? The same. Like when we when our banks are investing in Indonesia, we are doing the merger and acquisi- acquisitions job in in Indonesia. We were also affected by the same. So I would say that it will affect um, the uh, confidence in towards investing in Malaysia or abroad. Hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Lo, for being with us today. Not at all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you again Will at you? tomorrow's <laughs> Asian Breakfast Call. We hope um, we hope to see you, but tomorrow we're not going to have uh, a session. We'll see you on Monday if you want to come on the show. <laughs> all right. Thank you.